So again, my name is Gene Berthoff. I am with YRC Freight. I'm the VP of Pricing and Revenue Management. I've been in my role for about eight months now. So when I was first approached by pros to, to give a presentation here, um, I thought, sure, pick on the guy that's been, at that time I was in my role less than four months. Uh, pick on the guy that's new industry, you know, new role to kind of come in and give a case study, give a speech about enabling pricing data, um, um, pricing solutions with data-driven solutions. So um, I. I, I, first I thought about it and I was hesitant to join, but I started thinking no matter where you're at in your cycle, there's always an opportunity to look at utilizing data better within your, within your operations. Um, what we'll talk about today will be a different than a lot of the other sessions that you've gone through here today. It's going to be much more case study driven, so I'll talk through some of the things I found in my brief tenure at YRC, some areas that we're taking it, and hopefully that'll challenge you to look for certain things in, in, in your um, respective organizations. So again, I'll give a little bit of a backdrop of what I found when I came into to YRC, um, and then from there we'll identify the problem that I saw, and we'll go into what we're in the process of implementing. So um, when I came in, we had very mature pricing tools and, um, uh, and processes. Uh, that's good and bad. Um, mature from the standpoint of people were, had a strong sense of ownership. There was a little bit of hesitancy to change, not a lot. Um, actually, I was surprised at, at how how much people were willing to listen to somebody from a different industry. My background is airlines, um, uh, pricing, consulting, and, and different manufacturing and distribution. But I never touched on the LTL space before. Um, the, but there were mature processes, m mature tools that existed within, within the organization. There's very specific optimization around a lane and a segment basis. So they were very complex in the pricing that they were employing um, at YRC at the time. Pros has been on site, uh, implemented on site at YRC since 2015. I think there's an opportunity for us to utilize it better than we have in the past, but it's been an integral part in how we go to market with, uh, with our pricing. We've got an experienced staff of pricing managers, so many of the people that uh, I work with 20, 30 years is not uncommon, having been in the LTL space specifically with YRC. Not a lot of movement back and forth between organizations. Some, most of these people, like I say, I would, I would venture that the, the average 10 years is about 20, 20 plus years. Uh, pricing options for transactional business. So a lot of what we do is customer negotiated pricing. It's pricing that, that uh, is applicable for a, a period of time, three months to a year. Um, but we are delving in a lot of areas, both in spot, which is more of the, the larger volume type of business, uh, as well as um, a, a new venture within the last couple of years that we go directly to the smaller consumers uh, through our website where we offer a dimensional based pricing um, that's a lot easier to use, a lot easier to interact with. You don't have to understand the, the basics of a, an NMFC uh, class based solution to, to be able to navigate. So at the same time, um, there was a big desire to shift into what I'll call yield management. Uh, it's not shifting away from pricing, but it's adding more focus to, that, to, to what I'll call yield management. Um, and I don't believe that's an industry term in the way that I use it, so I'll explain the way I use it. Pricing, I think of pricing as the initiation of a customer-specific price, and yield management more as the, the methodology and the control looking at broader systemic things that you can do to, to increase your yield opportunities, things that you can do uh, within a customer engage, engagement to be able to further that relationship, to be able to further the, the yield opportunities over time. And also there's a strong desire to become more efficient in our processes. Um, we did a lot of things manual and we're looking for ways to employ data to drive better decisions, um, less touch points, um, not necessarily less touch points with the customer, but less touch points on our side to be able to get to the final resolution. So with that backdrop, um, I would summarize that to say we wanted to look at ways that we could be faster and leaner, ways that we could be less manual, fewer touch points, uh, be able to turn things around more, more quickly, and more robust in the offerings that we brought to market. So recognizing the challenge is always the hard part, and I would love to say new guy in, I was able to step up to the plate and notice the, the inefficiencies we had within our system day one. That, that didn't occur. I was digging down, learning more about the business. And actually, this exercise started with a, tri with a, with a training, uh, a deep dive into our training exercise. What we have typically is um, a need to be able to backfill our pricing manager roles um, as, as, we, as we have a need for new people in those roles. And we don't often find that we can go out to the industry and recruit those people directly into this role. It's um, heavy expertise needed in the industry, heavy knowledge of our process, heavy knowledge of our um, systems, 
Uh, and what we find that works out better is that we, we um, bring analysts in, we train them as a, like you would a farm team. Uh, we bring those people up and then we're able to move them in the roles as we need. Uh, but what we were finding over time is it was taking us longer and longer to train those analysts. When we did have them, what we thought was trained, they were too specialized in certain areas. They, weren't, they didn't have quite the broad brush of expertise as we would like. Um, and there was a fair amount of attrition uh, in those ranks before we could get them into the roles that we needed them. So the exercise that, that I'll talk about today precipitated from us looking at how do we solve that problem? How do we understand what's going on in that training system, provide for better training, um, and ultimately be able to have a bench uh, residing as we have turnover in their pricing management ranks. So that's where it originated from. Um, as a part of that effort, we started looking at what is it that the pricing managers and the analysts do on a day-to-day -day basis? What's the body of work that they're employed with? Um, and we noticed a few things. First, the, the, of all the work that they're doing, there's a lot with respect to um, touch points, a lot, of, a lot of interactions that we're doing that aren't really adding value. It's not necessarily the bulk of the workload, but it is a lot of of pricing related activities that we're doing that ultimately don't tra either translate into business or translate into a small amount of business. Um, and a lot of that work was falling to the pricing analysts, whereas the bulk of the, the other work where it was translating into revenue opportunities was falling to the pricing managers. So if we look at, sorry, if we look at that, uh, if we divide that out um, and segment those types of, of work, which the, our pricing managers were already doing. What they were doing, the, the work was coming in. They were saying the work that we, that we deemed to be in this first camp is, go, is being assigned to the analysts, and I'm keeping the work what I, which I deemed to be uh, of higher value. That, that segmentation was already happening in our organization. The work that was um, not adding a lot of value was very repetitive, non-satisfying work. What we were finding was um, we were training our analysts to fill out files, not necessarily to think analytically, not necessarily to do the complex analysis. The impact that was coming out of those, um, that work was very small, not strategic, and it served as a backdrop of distraction away from the areas that really were driving values where the opportunity lied. On the areas where we were seeing value, um, that body of work was becoming more and more complex over time. Um, that we were asking for more state-to-state -state matrices, very specific granular pricing, uh, whereas before we might have had uh, uh, just a, a single discount. The, because of the fact that it was becoming more complex, it was requiring a lot more time uh, to, to be able to facilitate that. And there was huge opportunities in this work for, for yield improvement. So there were just, it was ripe for the picking, a lot of low-hanging fruit that we could do Unfortunately, we were tying up a lot of our time in the first bucket and not getting to a lot of the work. And when we did dedicate time into this space, the return on investment was, was great. Also within the first um, area, because the, the work probably wasn't worthy of manual effort to begin with, it wasn't worthy of manual effort to fix it once you've identified that it wasn't a high value add. And so over time, that created this baggage, if you will, this, this area of, of, of complexity that nobody was willing to step up and fix because it didn't seem to be worth the effort. A lot of that type of, those types of files, those types of contracts were falling out of our filters because they were small, they weren't really worthy of the time uh, uh, from, from either an automated or from a uh, touch point solution to be able to fix. And oftentimes the pricing assumptions that went into that data were wrong. If we had been honest about the pricing assumptions in the first place, we probably wouldn't have gone as deep into the, into the pricing negotiations as we did. Um, when we learned that the pricing assumptions are wrong, the impact, there's only a handful of transactions that are happening on those and it's not worthy of the manual time to, to, to fix it. At the same time, in the body of work that is adding a lot to the value, it's inconsistent measurement. Uh, so um, we, we bring business on, we measure how it, how it uh, operates in our system. In, in the past, we've done that on a very inconsistent basis. I would say that the follow-up process, you know, ascertaining whether that business is, is the assumptions that went into it are right and whether it's operating where I need it to operate in the business, um, would happen at least on a yearly basis because we negotiate those on a yearly basis. But you would want that to happen much more dynamically in real time coming out of the negotiation. And it wasn't happening that way. Um, the time periods that we were getting to it before the next year's negotiation, it was happening in what I'll call a, a, a knee-jerk fashion. So when I would go in and I would realize I've run a, 
a set of analysis and, and I've determined a certain portion of my business is not operating, I go in and, and, I, um, and I address it through negotiations with the customer, reaching back out to the customer, and it left the customer with a bad taste in their mouth. They, they're, they're saying, you're coming to me having conversations mid-cycle, I don't know why, you're not giving me the details, um, you, know, you just tell me it doesn't operate. Well, that's not an answer to give your customer. So after we identified this, we looked for ways to, to resolve um, the problem that we identified. Uh, and what we found is that we, if we can get better about triaging the bids as they come in um, and segmenting them, and I'll, I'll speak about segmentation in two different ways. One, one way in understanding at a high level something about your customer so you can pivot them in the right direction from a channel perspective. And that's what I'm talking about in this first perspective, uh, in this first um, piece. If I can understand enough about my customer to say, I'm going to point you towards a self-service route. I'm going to point you towards a customer negotiator route. I'm going to point you towards an existing program based on the attributes coming in. I can save myself a lot of time um, and ultimately um, get a better response out to the customer. Then also with best practices, we had, again, very tenured pricing um, managers, oftentimes people that had grown up with and created best practices of their own. They weren't necessarily sharing those things across the organization. And so what we found was a lot of people had, were, had very good practices that they weren't sharing it, and so we were doing it a lot of different ways. As we had people that would leave or be out on, on, on personal time, it was really hard for us to sub in other people because their processes were very different um, than, other, than other analysts. And so we're really talking about stopping sharing those best practices and make sure we pick what, which is best and, and implement that at a, at a company level. Consistent pricing, you know, you would think um, that um, the, the same data in would drive the same data out uh, in a lot of cases and, and what we found that that, is that wasn't the case. A lot, a lot of times to do with the best practices at an analyst level, um, but for other reasons we would look at the same thing with a different set of eyes and get a different set of answers. And so we had to solve for that as well. And a lot of that's got to do with the data that you're looking at and the processes that we wrap around those to ensure that, that the, the same inputs always generate the same outputs with respect to uh, pricing guidance. Machine learning, I would say we're really early on the, 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 the phase of this. A lot of what we do right now is more um, akin to uh, decision tree or, or process mapping type of, type of things, but we are collecting the data that's going to allow us to be a lot more uh, adaptive with this as we move forward. But it's feeding the optimal pricing based on the segments um, back out to your system so that you can um, uh, optimize based on the attributes uh, that you see at, at each of those interactions. So, and with that, when I'm talking about the machine learning, that's that's uh, the section that's oftentimes utilizing the segmentation. Um, we we've, as I said, we've implemented pros, um, but what we've done is is utilize it in a very uh, granular fashion on the customer negotiation sides. I would say there's a lot of opportunity for us to further embed that, um, both into different processes, also into more automation, such that we're we're limiting the touch points that we have with our uh, inside of our organization moving forward. So that deeper, deeper uh, pros utilization, driving that adoption into the organization, not only from the pricing um, organization, but the understanding and awareness of where that data and where that um, the, the negotiated price, the guidance is coming from, um, the fact that it's not a, a gut feel, the fact that it's a, a you know, data-driven solution out through, for example, to our sales. So there's more confidence in the, in the recommendations. And then creating wrappers around a lot of this. Um, as I mentioned, bringing, when customers come in, segmenting customers and having this send to the right channels, a lot of those channels are, uh, we have a self-service channel. We have a channel that is going to um, uh, segment certain, uh, at, based on the segments coming in, provide a much quicker response than a negotiated response. And a lot of times that's what some customers are looking for. Uh, and we miss the boat when we've taken everything and brought it into a negotiated cycle. So creating those program wrappers for certain segments um, creating that adaptability and that ability to, to respond really quickly to market through uh, an existing program. Account follow-up. This is a big, big area for me, and, and I won't touch into it a lot um, here necessarily. But in the past, uh, as I mentioned, we would bring customers on, and we weren't always necessarily um, learning fr from what we brought on. So there's, there's segmentation attributes, there's assumption, pricing assumptions that are made when you're bringing a customer on, either through um, the data that the customer's providing, either through um, what they're telling you themselves or what you're ascertaining from the history of the customer. You're, you're making some assumptions that go into your pricing decision. 
we weren't doing a really good job of following up the, in that 30, 60, 90 type day, type day period to ascertain if the data that's coming in supported what the assumptions were going out. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, if we were following up mid-cycle, it was much more from a, um, uh, f from a broad scale action where we looked at customers that were performing at certain ratios, much less so from an account health perspective, going to the customer, having a discussion with the customer. You told me X, Y, and Z as far as your freight characteristics, as far as the expectations on volume. I observed something different, and so therefore that's why I'm coming back to you with a, with a new pricing negotiation. Uh, that actually uh, is, so we've just started this process, and that actually is changing, pivoting how we're having conversations with our customers. In the past, it was very, combative, confrontational a lot of the periods of time, especially when we were in a yield push. Um, now moving forward, when we're going back to the customers and we're saying, hey, um, you know, you had told me that this was going to be the characteristics and I've observed why. It's a lot easier conversation. They understand why their pricing's changing. They're less, um, less apt to be frustrated with the, the movement in price. And then a profit focus beyond pricing, um, and specifically here I'm, I'm referring to sales. So. Um, I think this is something that, that YRC was already starting down the path, but well before that I, I came on board. Um, but it was getting sales out of the paradigm of I have to sell at all costs and I'm, I'm driving for volume. It's getting them thinking of the impact of the volume on the system. It's getting them in, um, um, a certain knowledge around what profit I'm going to drive and not all businesses is, is the same. Um, really setting up the incentives on their side to drive um, good, good business, not just any business. And so this will sound a little trite, but ultimately the, the goal here, uh, and, I, and haven't had enough time to be able to truly test this, is to create a more collaborative approach, um, partnership, um, throughout sales, the customer, and pricing. And what I mean by that is if you can go to the customer and you can explain to them through the attributes that we were talking about earlier, what goes into driving their pricing, what costs drive their pricing, what things they can do to change their behavior to impact the cost, therefore impact the pricing. It's a collaborative back and forth. Um, you know, customer's going to ask for something and, you, and you're going back to them. You've trained them around what drives their pricing. If you can do X, if you can do Y, um, I can do what you're asking in pricing. It's that um, recognition that, that their behavior drives a lot of what the pricing paradigm is. And so I want to talk a little bit about the benefits that, that, that we're hoping to see and some of which we've already seen in, in this transition. So, um, driving better outputs and customer interaction. Uh, we're early in, in this process. I think we have seen the better outputs. Um, so what's coming through the, the, the segmentation, the results from the pricing optimization, um, the faith in, in some of those recommendations is, is vastly improving. And the customer interaction is, is improving, right? We're, we're spending less time going to them with mid-cycle corrections, more time talking with them about um, how to improve their freight, why their pricing is such based on their, their behavior characteristics. Better allocation of resources. If I can have my analysts spending less time on, on areas that aren't driving value, more time on areas that are driving value, that's a, that's a, great, um, um, can, that's a great situation for me. Also, um, I end up with a scenario that I have better job satisfaction, specifically in the analyst ranks. Uh, because they're actually working on things that matter now, not just things that they feel like that uh, they're just checking off the boxes. Um, we're already starting to see better retention. We've, we've in, in, in collaboration with this, we've actually changed the way we organize our pricing department. Our analysts sit together, learn from each other, um, are not siloed into different areas. So we don't expect that in six months or a year from now, we'll have those analysts that, that are very specialized in certain areas. They, they will have some specialty, but they'll also understand how pricing works across all the organization. Specifically, we're doing a rotational program that gets the analyst exposure to a lot of different areas within the organization. So that allows for better success in succession planning. So I'm able to um, pick up a, um, most of the analysts that have been through the solution and put them almost anywhere I need to in the organization, whereas before it would have had to have been somebody that lived in that and breathed in that type of um, um, channel and, and, and knew exactly how that interacted. So I had limited uh, analysts I could choose from based on where my opportunity lied. Improved revenues, I think that makes a lot of sense, focusing on what m moves the needle. Um, this is kind of my mandate from, from my leadership. It's where um, profit and revenues is where, what I'm being asked to do. The rest of it is, is, is how we get to that, uh, but that's how I'm able to facilitate that is, is, is through this, this work. 
fewer errors and greater efficiencies. So if you think about it, um, the more and more we do custom pricing and we have exceptions to the logic, the more uh, those loads and those negotiations, there's opportunities for misalignment or uh, mistakes when I'm entering it. And so um, one of the things that we've started to see already is a, is a reduction in the errors around how the pricing is set up, um, fewer billing and rating type of concerns. Um, and because of that, um, because of a lot of the automation, so when I mentioned earlier, coming in and segmenting certain things are going to be self-service or are going to uh, navigate to programs that are going to be with ni nice automation wrappers. Um, we, we're, we're able to, to do that in a very consistent manner that, that doesn't drive errors and ultimately drives greater efficiencies. I'm able to take those resources that we aren't spending on the lower um, value add um, opportunities, spend them more on the higher value add opportunities uh, and actually give them exposure to things that move the needle and not just um, creating, our, uh, creating analysts that can just click through certain steps. Faster throughput, this is, um, this is something I've heard several times at the conference this week. Um, it was a session earlier today and a session yesterday where they talked about uh, you know, if I can't respond fast enough to the, to the customers, um, I'm going to miss out. And, and that has happened to us in the past where we were either slower than our, than our competitors or slower than, than the market needed for us to be able to reply because there were so many opportunities at a certain period of time you're prioritizing. And, and that's a shame. I, I'm ashamed to admit that that actually was happening. We're, we're trying to get to a position where certainly the ones that are going through and, and navigating through an automated route are almost instantaneous. And those that aren't instantaneous um, because of the additional resources that we can dedicate to them are moving a lot more quickly through the, through the workflow. Fewer escalations and, and faster resolu resolution. If we're making fewer exceptions to the pricing, creating more standard programs, there's going to be fewer opportunities for things to get escalated on our side. It allows us, when they are escalated, um, we're not dealing in a situation where everything is an exception. Um, so therefore, when we do have exceptions, we can actually turn those around a lot more quickly. And ultimately, the last one I'll refer to here, lower costs. It's easy to think um, I work in, in pricing. Implementation of that pricing is, 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 is under my purview. Those areas I control, and we'll see certain um, um, improvements in, in our ability to touch things less, and therefore we have fewer costs. But there's a whole host of support functions around this that drive costs as well. Our operations, um, our billing and um, rating engines, um, there's a lot of different areas that uh, when we create complexity, when we create, <clears throat> when we solve for this, we're able to lower the costs in. And so ultimately, um, us lowering costs, providing um, a service that, that is not as burdened will allow us to, to impact our pricing to the customers. So a couple of areas I wanted to talk about on the horizon, this is my last slide. Um, uh, just some things that I see moving forward in freight that, that I'm excited about, um, things I would like to see um, moving a lot faster than what they are in right now, is the optimization across pricing um, and operations. So like I said, I come from uh, an airline background and I'm used to a scenario where operations and pricing and revenue management are really dovetailed, where, where decisions in one um, are directly uh, in, um, uh, reflected in movement in the other. Um, it, in some cases in the airlines that was manual, in some of the other cases there were systems around that. In the freight um, side, I, I've seen very few <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> opportunities to simulate. For example, I have a, a new customer. If I, had, if I was selling to a brand new, really large customer, I would want to know how that customer is going to impact my network because impacting my network negatively could increase my cost um, footprint. Um, if it fits in really well and I'm able to do directs uh, and a lot of this change the way my net network flows, the perspective costing I have uh, that I'm utilizing to, to weigh the value of that is, is oftentimes wrong. So being able to combine that, look at that together would, would change the perspective on pricing as far as the costs that drive it and therefore ultimately my price. <coughs> Acceleration of pricing into Density Cube. Um, I, I talk about Density Cube here, but what I'm really referring to is dynamic pricing. So I talked earlier about um, uh, most of our pricing. There, are, there is some that's, um, that, is, that changes daily, changes weekly. There's some that changes every three months, but the bulk of our, of our customer negotiated pricing changes once a year, maybe even once every, every two years. Excuse me. <coughs> So that's where we're negotiating with customers, and they're expecting us to 
um, to uh, save um, a certain amount of capacity for them out in the future at a certain pre-prescribed -pre price. Um, in, a, in a dynamic environment, that would be something that we would be able to offer uh, to our customers, be able to change prices both up and down based on how the day of week, based on how we are towards the end of the month, what our demand profile looks like. Um, it certainly allows us to optimize revenues, but it also uh, uh, creates a scenario where certain customers are going to get a lot lower prices in certain um, areas than they would today. So it's an area that, uh, that I'm interested in moving towards. I, I'd also like to see the, the, um, the movement towards a density queue base because that allows for less complexity. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, shippers today are very used to the NMFC class-based system that we have, um, but smaller shippers, uh, for them, that's a foreign concept. It's a lot, really hard to understand. So today, this is something that we utilize much for a smaller uh, carrier, but we are seeing some interest in some of the larger shippers to be able to move to this type of a model. And it, the last one I kind of touched on earlier, but it's explore options for less contracted supply. Um, so uh, today, uh, when we uh, negotiate an agreement, um, at least up until this point in the past, it's often been that we're we're negotiating for a certain amount of supply um, uh, on, on our network, but there's not a huge commitment from the customer on what, the, um, what, they'll be, what shipments they'll be providing us. And so the, the onus is, is heavily on, the, on the, sh the shipper, I'm sorry, on the, the, the freight line themselves. Moving forward, what I'd like to see us move towards is a scenario where we are able to move that price, at least within a band, more dynamically to, to account for um, Areas where we've got uh, network constraints or account for um, sharp, sharpness in demand, and that sort of thing. Really create an area where we have a, a partnership opportunity to remove costs. So it's talking with those customers uh, about what's driving their costs, talking with them about areas they can change their behavior to, to, to uh, improve the price. And, and ultimately, like I say in the last point, is to allow for more fluidity in pricing. So, uh, that's some areas that I'd like to see move um, moving forward. So with that, I will stop and ask if there are any questions. Yeah, got some questions. So a couple um, around the same theme. Um, how are your salespeople incenti um, incentivized and do you link it to the adoption of the pricing? That's a great question. I, I would say um, not exactly the way I would like to see them incentivized um, moving forward. Uh, oftentimes in the past, it's been um, mostly uh, around the volume um, type basis. We're starting to see some shift, more profitability metrics, KPIs, uh, and that's a, that's a good thing. We're not quite there yet. I'd, I'd say um, today we're, we're, we've just started that journey. They're aware that not all freight is equal uh, and that not all, all opportunities are equal, but we're not exactly where we need to be on the incentive side. I'm sorry, the second part of your question was? Um, is it linked to the adoption of the pricing? So it's not linked to the adoption of the pricing. So our sales and pricing are, today are divorced. Um, I would like to see a lot of the pricing guidance to be provided to the salesperson, again, allowing them to, on certain segments of the market to move within a band, uh, like you would expect on a configure price quote type of, type of solution. But today, um, that, that control resides in the pricing department, and those, uh, that's a negotiation between the pricing and, um, and sales as far as where we land on the price. Okay, thank you. And then um, how did your pricing initiative align to the strategic corporate initiatives? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I live and die by the sword, uh, which is the profit, profit and how I'm able to improve our, our, our numbers. Oftentimes that's transcribed into yield. That's typically how we're measured revenue per hundred weight by the industry. It's not always a great measure, uh, metric. Uh, there are ways that, that it can be bastardized. But, um, but so I, I'm, I'm, um, my goals are to improve those metrics. What we're able to do with this type of solution, bringing the data in, is ultimately to improve those metrics. I can make better pricing decisions if I'm aware more about how the uh, more about the customer, how to be able to segment the customer, and how to be able to put the right pricing in front of them. So. Okay, great. And I know you talked about the value, and the question was, have you measured the value you are getting? It, it, it's a <laughs> specifically the the value from the. Uh, I'll speak a couple different areas. The value from um, the right price at the right time is oftentimes really, really hard to measure. I've been, I've, I've sat through this across manufacturing, distribution, airlines, uh, and now freight. 
Um, and it's really hard to subscribe a value to, for example, segmentation and optimal. Um, you know, you hear things quoted around, but when you're actually a practitioner in there, it's, it's really, really hard to do. So um, we're just in the process of implementing this, and I think some of them we are able to, to prescribe a value to. And we're able to spend more time on yield management and be able to, for example, change an SSORIAL to, to be able to, to uh, either change the dynamics of our freight so it's easier to move um, or, in, or have the customer pay for areas that are freight that's more diff difficult to move. We're able to subscribe, subscribe a value to those types of things. So some areas are easier to me measure than others. Um, specifically in the whole, I would say it's a hard thing to measure. Okay. Uh, one more. This is a little bit long one, but after you quote a price to a customer and you don't hear back right away, do you have the opportunity to call them and follow up to discuss a different discount in the recommended price envelope? I, I would like to see more flexibility in that, um, and the more you can move towards a more dynamic price, um, the easier that is. When you have an RFP that comes out and a customer is requesting pricing, and you're locked in for a year, oftentimes they're, they've loaded that into their, into their order management systems, TMSs, um, and they're already acting, act, acting upon that. Now, yes, they oftentimes would take a lower price, um, but in general, they're, they're trying to create those relationships with their shippers, and when you miss out on the first time, you may have to wait a period of time to come back around again. So most of the times, it's not as easy as going back to a customer and say, uh, you know, I told you um, 100, and now it's 98. It's not, it's not, it's not that simple. Okay. Um, and last one is, do you see any competition with Uber? No, uh, honestly, I don't, don't see any competition with Uber. And I would think, um, you know, a lot of those type of, uh, of systems are going to be smaller packaging type of things, which is not really where we're, not really where we're at. LTL Freight is, you know, you're, it's not, not, not a, tr if people aren't aware, I probably should have started that. LTL Freight is not, you know, your full truckload type of piece, but it's not your small package either. It's, you know, partial truckload stuff in the middle. Um, and, uh, and we certainly haven't seen um, the, the com competition from Uber. Maybe some of the other people in the, in the market could say that they have, but I haven't heard anyone in the industry that's, that's overly worried about that. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And if you do have any follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer them.